Good morning, everyone. I'm Stephanie De Silva, NERI Communications Director, and today is June 15th already, last week of school for uh, most folks. Uh, and I'm here once again for Ask Larry and Bob with Larry and Bob. Good morning, Larry and Bob. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> here we are in episode nine. We've been doing this for nine weeks. Can you believe it? Three months we've been, over three months now we've been. I know. Everyone's been at it, so it's yeah, it's kind of amazing. It's been, these last nine weeks have been a heck of a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it seems like a lot longer than nine weeks. Uh, so let's begin with um, obviously, we're going to get to the biggest part of the news in a little bit of, of what's transpired in the last week or so. Um, but let's start where we usually do with an update on what's happening with Amy Mullen and um, the town of Tiverton. Sure. Uh, folks who haven't seen the first eight episodes uh, may not be aware that uh, Amy Mullen, who was the local president in Tiverton and our treasurer statewide, was uh, unfairly fired for engaging in union activities, which is, uh, of course, illegal. And we are in uh, all sorts of forums to contest that, including federal court, because uh, the only good thing that came out of the Janus decision, it underscored that union speech is political speech and political speech is protected under the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, which is why we are in federal court on Amy's behalf. Uh, another uh, victory uh, last uh, Monday, I think it was, maybe a week ago Friday, uh, the judge uh, made sure that um, the school committee and the superintendent will have to comply with our records request to find out what shenanigans they were engaging in behind the scenes in reference to the decision to fire Amy. Um, and then they uh, doubled or tripled down on their mistake because the school committee's attorney in a press release said, there they go engaging in political activity again. And that's kind of the whole point of the case that um, you're allowed to be sort of political and a zealous advocate your folks when you are speaking for the union. Hopefully, uh, uh, the school committee, uh, well before this travels through uh, the courts, will come to its senses and say, gee, maybe we made a horrible mistake here. Uh, maybe they didn't understand that um, the only conversations that Amy were likely to have with her superintendent were involving the union, because Amy is an early elementary special education teacher, and the superintendent generally does not visit her classroom unless it's to talk about union activities, nor does Amy visit the superintendent unless it's to talk about union activities. So for the school committee, who I hope watches our show, some of them do, I think, um, there's your hint to a path towards resolution and reinstating Amy to her job and saving yourselves and the taxpayers of Tiverton hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees. So we will never relent in representing any of our members and certainly... <laughs> Uh, as Larry and I have observed, this is one of the most egregious attacks on union speech in our collective times working for the union, which collectively is well over half a century. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, as always, we wish Amy best of luck in her pursuit. Um, we're going to start with, we have a question from, we have a lot of questions. Um, but let's start with a question from Charaho. Um, no name, but um, a member in Charaho is wanting to know about resources for professional development that will be available for teachers who are implementing anti-racist work into their curriculum. And what plans does Neri have for advocating for social justice education in all Rhode Island schools? Well, our ratio and social justice committees been working on that. Our professional development committee has been working on that. We're going to have a lot of resources available. Some have already been posted. Um, I would suggest go to the racial and social justice page on the NERI website and eventually be also uh, as soon as finalized be on our PD website. Uh, so there'll be a lot of opportunities for people to take advantage of that. We also have eight professional development days next year built into the calendar, be the perfect opportunity to take advantage of those days uh, for this very important and critical topic. So uh, we'd encourage uh, people not only to go to our website, but also to talk about doing that during their PD days next fall. The, uh, the link for that will be in the description of this video. Um, let me also mention while I'm thinking of it that on Wednesday at 3 p.m., I'll put a link for this as well, 
There's a um, AFL-CIO caravan that's gonna be happening across the country. We're doing it here in Rhode Island for racial and economic justice. And so I'll put the link for that so folks can get details if they're um, interested in participating. Um, also, there were, um, last week we put out an email to all members and part of that email was a series of links um, that folks can go to on the NEA page. And then there were also some non-NEA social justice um, links for people to look through and kind of get a sense of, you know, things that they could use for curriculum. Um, and those are on the racial social justice page now too. So that link will be there as well. All right, should we get into this um, reopening of school? <laughs> All the rest of the questions. We All the rest of the questions are on that. Why don't we start first with the announcement from last week? I don't, Bob, you wanted to just give us a little sure. uh, cap? How unusual in the last week of school, and welcome to the last week of school. Some, some of our folks are already out, but this will be the last week for everybody else, uh, that we're already talking about the reopening of school. Usually folks are focused on deep breath and relax, mm -hmm. but uh, that is not uh, something we're allowing ourselves to do this year. Um, here's what last week's announcement was really about, and then there'll be a long list of things we don't know yet. What it was about was a common school calendar. That's a big deal and an important thing to have because of the crisis. And I've always thought that a common school calendar had a lot of sense to it anyway for coordinating activities across districts and making it easier, um, not only on parents and students to know what's going on, but on um, our own members who might live in one community and teach in another so that the calendars would be coordinated. Um, so that is uh, flex patience and flexibility are going to be needed, but that was a good thing. So we know that we're gonna all start on the same day. We know that there'll be eight days set aside for distance learning um, that will also allow time during those days for professional development. Imagine that we knew what eight days it was going to snow. We called them in advance and said the teachers could still do PD if we agreed upon that. And we know that the kids will be home distance learning. If that helps you visualize what this calendar looks like. Um, what we don't know, and a lot of the questions that will come up, are what are we going to do to bargain, and it's bargain, it's negotiable, all our existing contracts, which all have different criteria, different number of days, different professional development schedules and everything else, how are we going to bargain, uh, probably through memorandum of agreement for a one-year basis, because this is a one-year calendar, uh, how will mesh our existing contracts and the new school calendar. For instance, if your contract says you've got a 187 day school year, you can sit down with management, with your Uniserve director, local leaders, and have them sit down with the superintendent and the school committee and say, gee, why don't we stick to the calendar and take those extra seven days and do them either before or after the school year? Or, gee, since we were going to devote those extra days to professional development, maybe we can nest them all together and use the days that are set aside for distance learning in the morning and do professional development in the afternoon. Or maybe there'll be some hybrid that you come up with at your local level, marrying your contract with the announced schedule so that, uh, and we'll talk about the safety, uh, which is our paramount issue for dealing with coronavirus next year. You know, safety is still first. Um, getting everyone working and paid is second. And then negotiating the impact of all these things is, uh, is the third thing on that list. So it still, it looks different in every district now, and it'll still look a little different in every district. But the one common thing is we have a school calendar. The governor did not say we're opening schools the way we opened them last September with everyone showing up. She said, we have a common calendar and we have a lot of work to do to figure out what schools look like in the fall. And that means we have a lot of work to do. And I, th I think the real key here is, again, we talk about patience and flexibility, but what uh, it might look like, and I know we have a question coming up from Black Island, what it might look like in Black Island, what it might look like in Central Falls could be two different things. So it's gonna be very important for the local union to sit down with management and any type of uh, negotiations that needs to take place uh, happens. 
And again, as I pointed out, this is for you know seven, eight months, a year um, before we can return back to back to normal. The other key will be for teachers at every building to get involved in the decision making process and be part of it. Uh, what it's going to look like if you have some students coming back, if you have some doing distance learning, how best to make that work in each individual school in each individual district. It is going to be guidelines or guardrails to you know how big a group could be, et cetera, and things like that. You know, does everyone wear a mask? All those type of questions. But it's got to come down to local negotiating, local bargaining. And we have been in contact and in, in talking with superintendents of how to try to work together uh, to make this happen. And the superintendents uh, are, are certainly open to discussing that. And uh, that's why the Tiverton situation is so upsetting uh, and so wrong, because now more than ever, the administration needs to be sitting down with the local union and with their teachers and staff and making this work. Uh, and that's the only way this is gonna work. Thank you. All right, so Larry, to you, we have Carolyn in North Kingstown. Based on the uncertainty of next year's school's model, are evaluations going to be system suspended or revised for the upcoming school year? Uh, that question we can't answer right now. We do know that it was changed a little bit for this school year. It's certainly, I just mentioned talking with superintendents. It's something we've talked with superintendents about, uh, depending on what the year looks like. If we go to distance learning, if we have a hybrid system, one of the things we have to do is to try to make it as easy as possible for everyone involved. And the primary, primarily two goals here, keep everyone safe and make sure education happens like it's been happening for the past three months. So if uh, evaluations or statewide testing needs to be put on hold for, for several months or for a year, we need to do that, we need to consider it. But again, that's, those are all things we'll be looking at. And uh, hopefully, again, sitting down with uh, the administrators, sitting down with Ride and saying this is what works best um, in alleviating uh, b burdensome stress on teachers and staff and students. Uh, Angela in North Kingstown is asking what Mary's position is on live streaming lessons from the classroom for students who are home distance learning while some students are in the classroom, physically in the classroom. Uh, it's a qualified maybe. Um, you could see, you could see in some ways where something like that would make sense if you had uh, a student or a subset of students who for their own uh, health reasons could not be in the classroom. You could also see logistically where that would be tricky um, because you'd really need to have that if you're at the secondary level, you would be following the camera, so to speak, following the student's schedule throughout the school day, and you could see how unlikely that could become. At the elementary level, it would be a more straightforward um, uh, production, so to speak. But then you've got uh, you've got the logistical issue of if you have so many students doing that, are you really going to be able to afford? financially afford a camera in every classroom and all the different channels and transmissions uh, that would be necessary to support it. It's a lot trickier uh, to, it, you can say the words, but then you think about the logistics behind it. One of the great concerns, Larry and I were on a call uh, with uh, all your superintendents and local leaders last week. And we talked about the whole range of possibilities of school being open in, uh, while being in compliance with the CDC, the Center for Disease Control Guidelines. Um, and one of the superintendents asked a very good question, you know, well, the governor seems to really want us to do that. And I said, well, the answer we have to give to the governor and to the Department of Ed is, terrific, here's what we think it would cost. Now they've set aside over $40 million to support costs related to that, but we need to know. And if you take it through the school day, uh, you're gonna have the buses say only half full. I mean, that's easy math, you need twice as many buses. You're gonna have the classrooms 60% uh, full, depending on the size of the class and the number of kids, could be as low as 40% if it's a tight classroom or or you might have some of the larger ones go to larger rooms in the building that aren't typically used, but it's going to cost more money. Um, you're going to need to 
clean those buses, clean the entrance and exits of the schools, clean the restrooms, clean everything more often, probably going to require more personnel, not less. So you take it through its entire, uh, you just think about the schedule and every logistical part of the schedule, it's going to have a cost. And if you're going to add a technology component on top of it, cameras, microphones, uh, phone links, Wi-Fi at home, good Wi-Fi in the classroom. Imagine the Wi-Fi bandwidth needed to do that from every classroom in the school, if you take it to its logical conclusion, and then every school in the state. So I get back to my original two-word answer, it's a qualified maybe. Um, and uh, if we have so many kids that need it, it's gonna be harder than if it's, uh, than if it's a small group of students. Uh, might also inform the answer well beyond the coronavirus epic for how can uh, uh, a student who is being quarantined for a particular health issue still engage in learning. So we're going to we're learning a lot, and some of it hopefully will be very useful for the future. Yeah, Bob makes a good point about the finances. I know there's what forty or forty two million set aside, but the uh, U.S. Senate has to come through when they're, not, they're talking now mid-July before we even know. It would be a lot easier if we know exactly how much money we had. Uh, all these costs are going to add up. And at some point, where does it become too expensive to do certain things? And that then uh, makes what we're looking at and what we do uh, could look different. And I hate that because I hate finances dictating what's best practice. Uh, but there are a lot of issues and we're going to need money. Um, and if that money doesn't come through, then we could be looking at something much different than what we're talking about now. So uh, there are a lot of questions going forward for the next month to six weeks. <laughs> You've muted yourself. Well, I'm muted. Oh, I on. muted myself because I had a, a siren going by. So sorry about that. So let's go to those questions now. Um, Joanne from Block Island, can some districts allow a hybrid of virtual and face-to-face -face learning even with the Rhode Island reopening plan? How creative can districts be? Well, uh, as creative, hopefully, as, as they can be. Uh, and uh, again, it goes back to what I said earlier, what we've been saying all along, is that's why it's so important to have uh, the staff involved uh, at each local level in each building, because what might work for Block Island, again, could look quite different for someplace else. Uh, what might look, uh, might work in one school building might be different for somebody else. It might depend on how many teachers, you know, uh, <clears throat> have issue, health issues and may not be able to return and may have to do distance learning. So there are a lot of questions there, but certainly, yeah, uh, as creative as we can be and think about what teachers and staff have done the last three months to reach students and to reach every student. Uh, creativity is gonna be very important going forward and we should encourage it. Uh, so that we reach every student and there's some, uh, there's a lot of, so that it's equitable uh, and, and we can pro provide equal access for every, for every student. Yeah, and I, I choose to be an optimist about this. If I remember correctly, Block Island was, if not the first, then one of the first to actually have a distance lear learning program uh, well over a decade ago so that uh, uh, high school kids could get access to, I think it was an advanced science course, uh, coming in from the mainland, so to speak. Um, and you think about that after, it, we're gonna have enough trouble dealing with the logistics of the existing crisis, but afterwards, if we have this technology in place, what's to stop a group of students scattered throughout the state from gathering in a distance learning way to take a course that might not be available at the local level taught by one of our members? So maybe a, uh, Cumberland High School teacher teaches physics too to a group of kids across the state. And uh, there's another group of kids across the state taking another advanced course and something else, um, you know, as an add on to their normal school day. So um, when you look to the other side of this crisis, maybe the learning that we engage in and on how to navigate things and the technology we acquire can be put to good use for the future. So that's the optimistic view. We just have to get through this get first. There. So patience, flexibility, and patience creativity. And flexibility <laughs> and creativity. <laughs> Which is hard because people want to know. Is yeah. it, that's why there's so much, you know, oh, it, anxiety. Yeah, I, it's just, it's, but that's, that's the answer. Um, because what it looks like on June 15th may look quite different on August 31st. 
Yeah, well, a lot of our districts, and this question actually came up last week, have a requirement. You must know your schedule for next year by the end of the school year. Uh, and uh, to say, well, what do we do? We file a grievance? Well, you could, but the answer is going to be, wow, there's this kind of coronavirus crisis. You're not necessarily sitting on your rights if you don't uh, grieve something that for which there is no answer. You could send a letter and say, uh, we're not sitting on our rights on this issue, but we recognize why we're not getting, why the contract's not being followed in this particular notification provision. Um, usually it's qualifying language when possible. Well, we get why it's not possible because we don't know. We don't know. Okay, <clears throat> Marjorie Foster Gloucester, very sweet. This, she says, I do not have a question today, but I just want to um, shout out to you that I love that you're doing this and thanks for all you do. Thanks, Marjorie. Thank you for watching. Thank you, yeah. Um, this is an anonymous question that came in. Are teachers with autoimmune disorders expected to return to the classroom in the fall? I understand that you're gonna keep giving the same answers, but I want we want members to know that we're hearing their questions individually, so. Safety first, uh, you know, this would be, uh, as in any situation or in conjunction with your physician, if the recommendation is you cannot participate in the school environment for the short or long term, um, we will have to deal with the impact and implications of that. Uh, I would expect that because we are in the middle of a crisis, an epidemic, um, that that's not going to be a unique circumstance and we will have to figure out. Uh, I think I said on the radio last week that I could certainly in a scenario where you're matching up teachers who have to teach from home with students who have to learn from home. Um, if that's not possible, then, then you go into the alternatives that would exist anyway in the contract, taking uh, medical leave, uh, possibly a, uh, a workers' comp uh, type situation uh, where because of the underlying health situation and the condition of the schools. So we will parse those out um, uh, one at a time, so to speak. But I suspect that if this is prevalent enough, there'll be some universal guidelines as well. Um, because remember, and this is as Stephanie said, we're gonna be very repetitive, safety first, safety first, safety first. Uh, it's gotta be logical, it's gotta, you know, but we have guidelines out there that we can follow. And, and to reassure, our members who are concerned about that, it is a topic of conversation we have every day. I mean, I don't think a day has gone by in the last two months that we haven't raised that. And that's with the governor's office, that's with RIDE, that's what our conversation with superintendents, with the big meeting, uh, large conversation we had last week with superintendents. Everyone's aware that this is going to have to be, it's an issue that needs to be addressed. And as Bob said, safety first, keeping everyone employed, knowing whatever solution we come up with. Um, you know, looking at a multitude of, of possibilities that in seven, eight months, a year, then it goes back to the way it was. So we do need some short-term solutions for this. Let's go to Michelle and Bristol Warren, who has a three-parter. Um, all, I mean, all obviously valid and important questions, but again, I think you're probably going to be giving me the same answer. But um, Michelle is obviously concerned about reopening um, and how to best assist members that may not be able to return to the buildings for a myriad reasons. Um, what specifics should we be aware of when assisting and supporting these members? How do we maintain equity among those members that are working in school uh, versus those that are working remotely? And what can we do, if anything, about teachers that are involuntarily transferred as a result of some teachers needing to that, do that work from home um, and, um, how are we handling that so that everything is um, equitable? The involuntary transfer is a nice uh, uh, framework for answering a lot of the other questions because uh, part of the answers always go to what the contract says. And if the contract isn't specific enough to deal with the pandemic related volume of business we would get with something like involuntary transfers, you might, uh, have to or want to enter into a memorandum of agreement with the administration for rules during the pandemic versus the general rules that the contract can deal with one-on-one. Um, my advice, Michelle, and, and this is, where, well, my first advice is talk to your Uniserv director, sit down and figure out where you wanna be as a local and then, and then proceed accordingly. But my advice on top of that is, um, 
uh, any changes made because of the pandemic that are reversible back to whatever the old normal was should be entered into in that agreement. In other words, if we have to have an entire rule for next year um, where some folks are doing jobs different than they had before because of involuntary transfers, because of matching the folks who uh, are safe in the building and who need for safety and health reasons not to be in the building. Um, and then a year from September, you go back to the way things were, uh, you know, the prior September, so to speak. So you, uh, you might have a very different year next year to accommodate all the competing interests, but that can be temporary and we know how to, we know how to negotiate uh, uh, things like that. Um, one more from Michelle. Um, this is more about um, grieving. So what if a superintendent decides that they'll be pushing decisions through, well knowing the decisions that are contract violations, but claiming they are quote unquote necessary due to the world pandemic? Um, we realize that we can file grievances, but will those grievances actually go anywhere? What's your, um, what's your suggestions as to best handle these types of demands? I think, oh. I think, oh, uh, uh, I think Bob just, uh, you know, said it about, uh, sit down with your superintendent, sit down with your staff and see you what's workable, what might not be workable. And, uh, the little flexibility does work in here. For example, when we had, and give you an example. Um, a lot of people lost April vacation, um, would move back to March, but they still did a lot of work preparing for um, distance learning. Um, we didn't file grievances around that because of, the, because of the situation. We did work with Ride and with the governor's office to get PD days and a couple of vacation days built in for the next three months. Had, had a district said, well, because of this, you're gonna work 10 hours and we're gonna have you you know, working eight hours straight through with distance learning, then we'd file grievances and that's, that's unacceptable. So I think working with the Uniserve, uh, what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. We don't give up any rights uh, going through this. We may be able to work out some memorandums of agreement uh, to get through the next year. We don't give up our collective bargaining rights going forward because of this. Yeah, more for the general world that might tune in to ask Larry and Bob versus our members who already know this. On most things, on the majority of issues, we are actually in agreement with administration and school committees trying to fight for better resources to educate students, and we are fully aligned. The subset of people, and I'm looking at you, Tiverton, uh, administration, that try and take advantage of a crisis will be met with the full weight of our 12,000 member union and the AFL-CIO behind us, which will be you know, court grievances, board of education, and every forum and venue we have, including public relations, to point out their bad behavior. But that aside, we generally believe, especially because there's a crisis, we can be smart and flexible and work things out. Um, the example uh, I gave earlier, I think, came from a question from Bristol Warren that we get, you're not gonna be able to tell us the September schedule by the last day of school this year. We just get it. Um, technically are required to under the contract. Don't really need to file a grievance to know the answer that they couldn't. But if you're gonna start playing games with people's jobs, careers, lives in an unfair way, we will respond harshly. Um, not our first preference, it never is, never is. Um, but we know how to do both parts of that. And I fully expect, um, that on the vast majority of things, we will have a united front um, and work together and, and meet the needs of the students first. And when that relationship gets frayed, as it did in Tiverton, we will, we, people know we're not afraid to fight hard for our folks. All right. So our last question is from Beth in Cumberland, who is stressed out, understandably, um, and so her concerns are, you know, shared by most everybody else. How are we doing this? How are we socially distancing in the school? How are we getting to school safely? Um, and I think one of the, um, one thing that we can pull out of her um, question is, what are the provisions going to be for someone who has underlying health issues? I understand that we did um, cover this already, but, um, I want Beth to know that we hear her. We hear her, um, her stress and her 
uncertainty moving forward. I, th I think if you're not stressed out during this time, then uh, probably something's wrong. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, and that also would lead me to say that as every, and I'll do it in my ending, but maybe uh, everyone needs to take a deep breath as school ends here and just take a little time for yourself and your family. But for that, Beth, is this, what we've been saying, we're going to work that out. We'll work it out at the local level. It's topic of conversation again with everyone we talk to. We understand that people have underlying uh, health conditions and may not be able to go back if it's face-to-face -face learning. Uh, safety is, as Bob has said all through this, is our number one priority, uh, keeping people employed and, and, and providing education for our students uh, follows right behind that. So we're going to continue to work on that all summer. We're not going to put people who have health conditions at risk. Um, we're not going to put students at risk. Uh, we're going to be smart about how we do this. And that's why it's so important for administrators to reach out to their, their building staff. And that includes everyone, teachers, support staff, custodians. They're the ones that have, you know, keep the schools running, keep the building clean. They're going to have to do all this. How do we make that work? If class size can only be 20 and people are coming through the door, how do we make lunch work? How do we make recess work? Uh, everyone needs to be involved in that decision making. Yeah, the danger of using shorthand is that people might not feel heard. And when we talk about safety first, just that one word, we are absolutely talking about your mental health as well as your physical health and the social and emotional needs of not only our students, but our members who are on the front lines of this crisis. Uh, I think I said in one of the early episodes, a firefighter friend of mine said, we're all first responders now. And our uh, teachers and education support professionals, our municipal employees, our state employees at the Department of Health, we've talked about extensively, and our higher education faculty and staff are all first responders to this crisis. And they are dealing with something that is unprecedented in most of our lifetimes. Um, and besides all that's going on with the pandemic. We're also dealing with a country that's tearing itself apart um, because it's finally coming to grips with a long history of total lack of sensitivity to uh, equity and justice. So it's a lot. It's a heck of a lot and it's all happening at once. Uh, we heard the analogies to the 60s combined with maybe a pandemic on top of it and everything else. So we're going to have a lot of work to do. And our professional development will not only be about teaching under the pandemic and about racial and social justice. It's going to have to be about uh, behavioral and mental health, uh, not only for the kids, but for all of ours as well. So uh, we hear you because we're feeling it. <laughs> at the same level you are, Beth, and everybody else. So thank you for asking. It's an important thing to, to end on and something we need to acknowledge every time we do one of these. So thank you for the question. It's so important. I'd like to thank everyone for the questions. We had a good, um, good amount that came in. Um, we know that from the um, reopening announcement for, that the governor said we would get, be getting more information at the end of this week, so um, knowing that, I am going to work on a return to school page on our website. So our website had the COVID-19 page where we were pumping all of, as stuff was coming in so quick, we were pumping that all onto the page. So I am going to do that for the reopening of school. So once that's done, I'll make sure I get that out to everybody in an email. But that's where I'm going to try and put all of the stuff that I'm assuming we're going to be getting, all those guardrails and such. Um, but again, thank you to the folks who um, uh, sent in questions and we're going to keep doing this. Um, it might look a little different over the summer, but I think we're definitely going to keep um, this going to make sure that your questions are answered. You guys have any closing words? Although Bob, that was pretty good. <laughs> Yours. You know, Bob, Bob, you know, did a little what Bob said. Just I, I want to thank everybody. Uh, our 12,000 members uh, have just been fantastic. And I know it's been a tough three months, but please please uh, take some time over the next couple of weeks for yourself and your family. Uh, if you know me going for, a, I went for a, kind of a long bike ride yesterday, cleared my head and uh, that's how it works for me. For some of you, which is spending time with your family, reading, just sitting down and doing nothing and not worrying about anything. Uh, but take care of both your physical and mental health as well. 
uh, and thank you for everything you, you've done. Um, we will continue these over the summer uh, to keep you as informed as we can. And uh, uh, yes, we got this uh, come fall. It's going to be, it's not going to be easy, but the last three months haven't been, and you have certainly risen to the occasion. So thank you for everything that you do. See you next week. See you next week. Yeah. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Thank you.